Hello everyone, welcome to the March meeting of the Ottawa chapter of the Canadian Aviation Historical Society. Before we get to tonight's presentation, I'd like to mention a new video done by Glenn Matthews that has been posted to our CAAHS YouTube channel. The video is an interview with retired Department of Transport accident investigator, Dr. Olaf Skenna, recounting his experiences working on the accident investigation of Pan Arctic Airline, Lockheed Electra CF PAB at Ray Point Northwest Territory in 1974. My thanks to Glenn for capturing that fascinating story and allowing us to share it with our viewers of the channel. I will add that I'm recording this presentation tonight so anyone who wishes to see it again or anyone who's missed it uh, can find it on our YouTube channel and it should be posted in about two or three days once we get everything uh, gussied up and looking good. So tonight's speaker is Dominique <coughs> Prinet. Uh, Dominique began his flying career in France before emigrating to British Columbia, Canada at the age of 25, where he became a commercial pilot and instructor. From 1967 to 1971, he was a bush pilot based at a Yellowknife Northwest Territories, flying Beaver, Otter, and Beach 18 aircraft on wheels, floats, and skis in the Arctic and High Arctic. Later in the 1970s, he became the vice president of Nordair and in the 1980s, Canadian Airlines. He also spent five years in Tanzania turning around and managing their national airline under a World Bank project. Since retiring, he has spent his time teaching sailing in Vancouver. Dominique's new book, Flying to Extremes, Memories of a Northern Bush Pilot, has just been released this month. Please join me in welcoming Dominique. Thank you, Kyle. <clears throat> Thank you all for being here. Uh, I'm a little bit intimidated uh, talking to all these fancy pilots who are flying large and fast airplanes at high altitude. I have always followed the traditional wisdom of flying as slowly as I could and as close to the ground as I could. And, and it worked for me, I'm, I'm still around. So I'm going to show you some pictures of uh, my flying in the Arctic uh, after two or three pictures of the contraptions I flew in France before I came to Canada. So this is one airplane that I flew for over several summers. Uh, it's uh, in the early 30s. Well, I wasn't flying it in the early 30s, sorry. It was designed and built in the early 30s. That is, there's no cowling over the engine. There are no brakes on the wheel or spoke. There's no steering tailwheel. So this airplane had a tendency uh, when we were towing gliders to run into the gliders and chop them. It has a wooden propeller chop them in pieces because you couldn't stop it or turn it in time. It, ev it even ran <clears throat> in, in airplanes at times. Uh, the, the funny part is that it's quite flammable because it's made of wood and fabric. So to, to reduce the risk of fire, you could jettison the fuel tank. I see the fuel tank is underneath the seat here. And in the cockpit, there is a big red handle on the floor. So when you start burning and you want to drop the fuel tank, you just pull the red handle and the fuel tank comes off. Never tried it, but that's the theory. A another fun airplane with, with which I also flew uh, over several summers uh, towing gliders is this one, the German airplane. Here it is, you see it downtown in Paris on the Place de la Concorde. And there is a German guy, another one in the back over there. There's another fellow there. And the pilot is up front and there is an officer in the back. So it's right downtown in, in Paris. Notice the slats <clears throat> in the front of the wings here all the way along. Uh, and the, the, the flaps in the back, which extend all the way to the wingtip, to the ailerons. 
So this thing could fly at extremely low speed, so much so that I remember <clears throat> one of our instructors flew over the grass one way one day, and he uh, flew into wind a few, well, a meter off the ground, and the guy in the back opened the door and jumped off while the airplane was in flight, uh, which I thought was quite amazing. And another bunch of uh, young people on a, in a flying club, also on a grass runway, decided to see how many people would fit in the back and, and with how many passengers the thing could fly. So they removed the back seat and they piled up like students in a telephone booth or trying to cram inside the Volkswagen. Uh, they piled up uh, six people in, in the back. That's the thing. It's not only one seat. So they put six people in the back with the pilot. He still had the seat. And away they went, and they actually flew a few hundred yards down the grass, way, uh, grass runway. And then uh, they never did a full circuit, but they did get off the ground, fly for a while, and then, and then landed. And this is a fun machine because it's a civil aeroplane from which the Messerschmitt 108, 109 fighter was designed. So that's the original uh, fighter plane before it was converted really into, into a fighter plane. And it looks so much like the real thing that in the film, uh, The Longest Day, showing the landing of the Allies in the uh, Normandy beaches, uh, they didn't have any 109s, so they used the old bunch of 108s, which you could find in any flying club in, in France uh, until recently. Maybe there are a few left, I don't know. And uh, it looked like the real thing. The, the, the funny thing about it is that the, the undercarriage and the flaps are operated with a hydraulic pump. So on, on takeoff, the guys were flying with the left hand and, and pumping the wheels. And it was hard work and it was slow work with the right hand. So you could see the airplane undulating over the runway because one arm was, was triggering the movement of the other. So the, the guy would take off and you could tell, oh, he's trying to pump the, the undercarriage. And then it would stop. The undulation would stop for a while because it, it's not a constant speed propeller. You can adjust the pitch with a little switch on the dashboard. So you push the switch to the, to the left to slow down the RPM and you push it to the right to increase the RPM. So there you are pumping, <laughs> trying to gather a speed over the runway, pumping the undercarry and then stop and then jiggle the, the RPM with a little switch and then keep on pumping. And then I forget if there was one pump or two pumps or how you switch from the undercarriage to the to the flaps. But you know, and when on while you were climbing, you still had to adjust the RPM so it wouldn't go too fast as the airplane increased speed, and you still continue pumping uh, the, the flaps. So that was quite a takeoff each time. I, I really enjoyed. It. I spent a lot of time. I was eighteen or twenty years old, and and attacking convoys and shooting at at, uh, at uh, rail cars and, and locomotives and shooting at trucks uh, along the highway. It was just, just great fun. So that's the uh, northern part. And um, that's the beginning of the season. So the airplanes come back at the end of the winter on skis and land uh, and wheels. And they land at the airport in Edmonton. That's the municipal airport, downtown Edmonton. And then they're converted into float and you have to take off on the dolly. And I hated that because the airplane is just sitting on the dolly and we had to take off at six o'clock in the morning before there was any wind. But the surface of the runway is always a little bit convex. And so I was lined up with the dotted lines on the center of the runway, but there's absolutely no steering on the thing and there are no brakes. So when you apply power and the airplane starts turning a little bit because of the slipstream, you start going off in one direction. And if you start rolling down on one side or the other, 
then you lose control. And that happened to me two or three times. I, ended, I never knocked down a, a runway light. I was lucky, but I did bounce in the grass. And I was always terrified that the whole airplane would just fall off the dolly because it's just resting there. And uh, I, I never enjoyed that, that operation. So those are the flights I was doing. This is the Northwest Territories. Alaska is to the left. This is the Hudson Bay. And this is the Arctic coast, uh, Victoria Island. And I will talk to you about uh, places like Holman Island and Copper Mine. And here is Yellowknife and here is Fort Smith and the Arctic coast, Cambridge Bay. So I flew all these, the numbers <clears throat> represent different stories and different chapters. So these are the flights described in the book and I really flew everywhere. And the worst flight I did was this one, which goes way beyond the map to the 80s parallel. I will talk to you about it in a while. So this is Fort Smith <clears throat> on the Slave River, south of, uh, uh, south of Great Slave Lake. So we had uh, a float base with a whole bunch of airplanes. And we had a little shack uh, up here uh, on the edge. And one day, and the, we were flying trappers and prospectors back and forth in and out of the bush all the time, including dog teams and, uh, and, uh, and the, all the, the gear. And the only way to know where they are is to uh, put a little pin in the shack here on a wall map where there are millions of links. And each pilot, when coming back to town, would put a little color pin on the map on the lake, which didn't have any name, with a little tag saying uh, the, how many men they were to pick up, how much gear, how many dogs, uh, what type of sleigh they had, if any, or a canoe, and when they wanted to be picked up. So that was all very simple until one little fellow, a kid came in one day and he was very impressed by the beauty of the little colored pins on the map and proceeded to pull them out one at a time. And two dozen trappers and prospectors suddenly lost their identity. So it was pretty awful. We had several powwows. We spent days knocking on doors in town asking if anybody had a friend or a neighbor or a relative who was out in the bush and where was he? People were never too sure where they were. Uh, eventually, uh, we, I think we picked them up. We picked them up uh, without forgetting anybody. Uh, if we forgot somebody, he didn't have any family or friends or any relatives who complained about it. We picked them up at the wrong time and we came in with the wrong airplane. But that's okay. I think we recovered most of them. There's a guy who, who, uh, whom I, I picked up. I went to, uh, I, was, I got a call from a local carrier, uh, one, of, one of the airlines, and they said they had forgotten him for, for two weeks. So they said, look, when you go and pick him up, uh, don't rush to see him, just stop at a great distance from shore in case he's mad and start shooting. So I did that, I stopped and I shouted, and are you okay? And uh, yes, he said yes, so I came over and picked him up. And he wasn't mad, he, he, you know, those guys are used to, to be forgotten for a while and then somebody remembers to pick them up. So, uh, and the, the thing that I struck, I asked him, well, how, how long have you been out of food? He said, oh, about what, for a week now? But he said, I, I could go on forever because he, he discovered a, a very clever trick, which all of us could use. When you are short on food, what, what he was doing, he had a can of tuna. And each day he was eating half of what was left. So you start with one and then half and then a quarter, then an eighth and the sixteenth, and you can go on forever, this, except that the you know it gets smaller every time. But that's that's what he was doing, and that it worked for him. These are two guys who were picking up and they were really happy to come out of the bush after a number of weeks. 
that's another pickup of one trapper and some of his dogs. He had more dogs, and there's a, a sleigh there. And I had taken the seat, the back seat off the Cessna 180. Uh, and uh, so, and the dogs were so excited to come back to town that they all jumped on the pontoon, all slid and fell in the water. So I had to carry them on board one at a time. And as soon as they got in, they shook themselves dry and they were huffing and puffing and panting. Uh, there was moisture all around, so I couldn't see through the windows. And during the flight, they all wanted to see where we were going. So they were all leaning on the seats and licking the back of my head. This is Yellowknife. And it's taken from pretty well over the airport. But this is the place where we used to land on skis in the winter and on floats in the summer. It's fairly protected. That's taken from a, an order. That's a P2 tube. One day it, it came off in flight, it started banging. I heard bang and bang, bang. And I wonder what the hell is that? And it was the pinot tube which was bouncing from one side from the under the wing to over the wing to under the wing to over the wing, banging on each side, as it was called, caught in the turbulence of the wingtip, and then eventually it came off. Well, who needs a pinot tube anyhow? There I was practicing water bombing. That's that's me in the order, and that's in Yellowknife. And I was trying to aim at the rock, but I missed it. See, I, I dropped the load too early. But on another occasion, I dropped the load a bit too late. And it was a guy whom I, I never saw. He was passing by in a canoe, and he was hidden by this face here. And I dropped the load, I think, right on the rock, about a ton of water at the time. And <laughs> the poor fellow was, was with his canoe was filled with water, and he got it. A shower like never in his life before. But he, 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 I don't think it was mad. He, he didn't come back to the station to complain. Uh, that's another interesting flight. That's on Great Bear Lake in July. There is about six feet of ice, but it's rotten ice. So you can't land on skis and you can't land on pontoons either. But the edges are open. So uh, that's the northeast corner of Great Bear Lake, just north of the Arctic Circle. And I was flying for a lodge, which is just there to the right somewhere uh, between islands. And there was open water there enough to take off. And I, I had to move some boats from the lodge to a place with open water on the other side for the American fishermen to, to fish uh, lake trout, up to 40 pound lake trout. And I thought it would fly with two boats. So I tried it, but it wasn't a very good idea because after takeoff, I couldn't gain any speed. I was then over ice for a while. It was wide open in front of me, but I was going in the opposite direction to the Northeast. I was here, I'm flying to the Southwest. So I was going exactly in the opposite direction and, and couldn't gain enough speed or altitude to turn around. So I must have spent 10 or 15 minutes trying to gain enough altitude, enough speed to make a U-turn and then come back. And that's about after at least half an hour of flying, I had gained enough altitude that things were stabilized. But I was flying very slowly and the flaps are down, you can't see it, but uh, without the flaps, it wouldn't fly and, and pretty well take off par. But the, the lodge manager was so baffled to see this contraption get off the water that he, he used the other airplane, a small airplane, uh, to fly along and <laughs> take pictures because he couldn't believe it. That's another order on, in the Rockies west of Great Slave Lake. And for a week, I worked with the seismic crew, and they were blasting away in the, in the mountain. And that was a bit scary because it was I think in June or maybe late May or early June. And the lake was still frozen, but it was melted all the way around at the edge where water. So that means the ice is getting very thin. So I landed in the middle of the lake, which is okay because it had a ski do. And each time, each day I carried about half a ton of dynamite 
and and the rest was uh, was their gear and all the caps the detonators which are attached to to electric wires and so i i took off without i, I turned off all, well i kept the radios turned off didn't transmit and and i i turned off the master switch just to avoid producing radio waves which would could trigger a current in the wires and being naturally quite shy, I, I put the dynamite as far away from me as I could. There was about half a ton of dynamite in the back there. And the caps I thought were less dangerous when I put them up front. But I put my two passengers just on each side of the cap. So if, if it went off and if I went off, they'd, went, they'd go off too. I didn't want anybody to survive if they had killed me. He's a cute little guy. There's a a break in this in the in the class for a while so they all came out uh, to see the pilot and to see the airplane so i took a picture that's in a little first nation uh, community at the northeast end of great slave lake i'm going to show you some picture of this part of the arctic coast the perry river is is like this i will show you it, it to you on a map I think the following slide is the map and, and some, some areas over there. So this is the map we're using. There's no relief. Uh, you have no idea where the, the hills are or how high they are. Uh, no contour line, no color. The white is the land, the blue is the lake, and that's all there is to it. And one of the maps, not this one, but another one, there was a the big square in the corner saying, uh, be careful, some mountains have been reported in this area at possibly 3,000 feet. Well, it's nice to know. Anyhow, they, I, I went there for, on many occasions. You see, here's a trip that I did, and here's another trip I did, and. This is another one. And obviously I went also in that direction. And then I went with a mining group. There's nothing there, by the way, it's just the mouth of the Perry River. I don't know uh, why everybody goes through there because I guess it's a good landmark. And I did some more flying with people who didn't know where they wanted to go. There's another one like this and another one like that. You know, people tell you, well, we're left or right, or try to get to this place. They are usually uh, geologists. So they want to see some formations or some lake. Or, so they explore. So I had to keep track of where we were. So I wrote on, I drew on the map our, our trip. And then we went, we went down here and then down there. And they wanted to go over there. You know, after a while, if you don't write it on the, on the map, you, you don't know where you are. And here I flew several times with the water resources. So we're trying to measure the depth of the river of the Perry River, uh, summer and winter. And I noted Eskimo camp in here. We'll show you a picture of the Eskimo camp. And I noted that because in case of trouble, if I damage the airplane on landing or takeoff or I, something something happens, I noted that so that there. It might be help there, so it, is, it might be a way to. And I also noted the yeah, Hudson Bay Post. There is a little shack somewhere on one of the islands, the trading post. And even if it's unoccupied, maybe that could be shelter in winter. So every time there was something interesting that could be used, I marked it on the on the map. Now, with in that area, I spent. Uh, I think a couple of weeks with some biologists who were counting the Ross geese. And so we spent two weeks flying every day over the areas where the Ross geese were nesting. And we counted, and, and this is how we, we counted. We were flying in Cessna 206 on floats, <clears throat> and you count them one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And when you get to about 25 or 30, you say, well, there's 30 in a patch like this. And how many patches like this is there? Where there's one, there is two, there is three, there is four, there is five. And so we counted the birds this way uh, for hours every day over a fairly large area. 
And at the end of the two weeks, <clears throat> we counted 30,000 geese. And the guys were ecstatic because they had counted the birds in the winter in the Central Valley of California, and they had counted 30,000 Ross geese too. So it was the same geese. And there was a, a biologist and, and his PhD student who was writing his thesis on the Ross geese, and they were absolutely thrilled when they had, they didn't say they recognized the geese, but they found the same number of geese there. So the geese land on islands when the surface is just melted. There's probably ice underneath the surface. They, the, the water is frozen right to the bottom and it melts first on the surface. So the geese go to islands which are protected from the mainland by about a foot of water so that the foxes can't get at them. And they, they nest with, uh, use feathers for their nest. And then the kids, when they're born, just have a few weeks to, to learn flying. They, they practice takeoff and landing and do circuits. And, and they have, they, they've got to be fully licensed by the end of the summer, which is the end of August. If not, they stay behind. That's, that's as simple as that. If they can't do the job, they, these are eliminated because the whole family goes out uh, at the end of the summer. Here is the camp. One of the camps I used as biologist. This, this is quite spectacular. And I, when I was flying in those conditions, I was thinking, well, <laughs> can you believe that they're paying me to do that? That's an exceptional day north of Yellowknife. This is Nahani River in the Rocky Mountains. It's now a national park. It was pretty wild at the time. Nobody ever went there except one guy from Fort Simpson who went there every year. He was the only one who knew the river and could, and could make it. He carried his canoe up the hill and over the falls. And uh, I landed there very fairly regularly with the water resources, always hoping that my engine wouldn't quit while I'm taxiing. And we stopped for several hours and measure the water depth, temperature and velocity across and uh, many people have died in this valley uh, lots of lots of dead bodies and airplane crashes all over the place now these are the same water resources and i hope that you pray appreciate this picture and its composition and its color and its sharpness and its general beauty because that's a 1500 dollars picture so i hope you like it I bought it from uh, from a, a magazine. Uh, I'm sorry, I forget the name, but it was posed. You see, here are my three uh, three water resources people from National Geographic. National Geographic. If you wonder where they make their money, it's from selling pictures. So here is the lock, which is used to to drop to measure the water velocity, and at the same time the depth of the water. So this guy is really posing and holding the, I, I should have brought my camera with me and taken it, taking the picture myself. So he's pretending to drop, but holding it for the photo. This guy is pretending to write, and this guy is pretending to do something, but he isn't doing something until the measurement is finished. And then he continues another uh, three or four meters down the line. And in the meantime, usually that's another trip with the water resources in another area, but it's also close to the Arctic coast. This, this is very close to the Arctic coast in the middle of the Arctic coast. This is 200 kilometers away along the Arctic coast on another day with water resources on another airplane. So while they're measuring the depth and the velocity and the temperature of the river, I'm trying to prepare for lunch. And that's the tricky part, that's navigation. And even in the summer, you can go on for hours and hours and night like this. And remember, you don't have a compass. It doesn't work so close to the north. So you navigate with a gyro compass. And the gyro compass keeps 
the direction for about 20 minutes, maybe half an hour. After that, it starts creeping around, uh, usually to the right because of Coriolis, but you never know because of the cold and the friction. So it starts precessing, and after a while, you don't know which way you're going. And quite often, for at least 20 minutes or half an hour, you don't even know where you are. So it becomes tricky when you don't know where you are and you don't even show which way you're going. And that's at times it's a bit scary, especially when the weather is not too good. And a thousand kilometers further, this is what it looks like. You know, so if you, you know, you just sit there and wondering, not too sure which way you're going. <laughs> certainly not knowing where you are. And you continue until you hit something that, that you can recognize. So it's okay. It, it never lasts for more than 20 minutes or half an hour usually. And then you hit a, a, a big river or a big lake that you can finally recognize on the map. And then you change heading, reset your compass, your gyro compass, and then continue in a slightly different direction. I'm going to show you pictures of an isolated community of copper mine at the time. It's over there. Here is downtown Copper Mine. You see this little Inuit lady. The, the dogs are kept on a chain in, uh, in the summer and fed one Arctic char per day. The guy goes out with a net, net catches a whole bunch of fish, which he dries, and then feeds one fish to the, to the dogs. So the Arctic coast is right here, the little bit of the beach. That's downtown Copper Mine. And about 100 kilometers to the east of there, there was a small community with a few families. And I took this pictures because it shows this Inuit lady looking for seals with a spyglass, which is probably left by one of the early explorers in 1875 or 1900, somewhere in there. And God knows where she got it, but that's what she has to look for seals. And notice the 45 gallon drums for diesel fuel for heating and the caribou hides and the dog sleigh and the little Inuit boy. There's a beautiful young woman in the Arctic community to the east of the Northwest Territories. I'm going to show you some pictures of this area now, Bay Chimo Harbor and Bathurst Inlet. Here's Bay Chimo Harbor. That's the entire male population. Uh, the ladies are a bit shy and they stay away. But so there's maybe three or four or five families. And they saw no airplanes during the winter and maybe two airplanes, sometimes three airplanes in the summer. So when one came along, it was the excitement of the year because they have no radio and no television and no library. So they, uh, they're always happy to have visits. So they all come and look at my airplane. They even open the door to look inside. And there's an, another little kid in Bay Chimo Harbor. Uh, this is how I found my airplane one day, a little bit south of the previous community. The Arctic Ocean is just to the right. In fact, the ice, the ice was about a kilometer away. And uh, we, we tried to go back to, to town, uh, to, to Great Slave Lake, which was about four, four or five hours away from here, uh, over the hills. And the day before, I hadn't been able to go through. I tried and tried and tried. It got so bad that I came back. And the weather was absolutely miserable. And I was glad to be able to land somewhere. It turned out that the community was abandoned. There was nobody there. There was just a few shacks and an abandoned church with no benches in it and half the floor was missing and there was no door on it. So I had three passengers, American tourists. And uh, so I told them, well, stay in the airplane and I'll spend the night in the church. Well, the night, so to speak, because it's daylight all the time. And so they did, except that <clears throat> the guy in the back came over and decided this would be more comfortable in the church because he could lie down. So the two others moved up front as the airplane slowly sunk because the pontoons, it was the beginning of the season, 
and the pontoons had, had not been checked out thoroughly before they were put in, in Edmonton on the, on the airplane. So it was leaking, but slowly. So at the end of, of, of uh, the night, uh, they were full of water. Then I asked the passengers, were, you know, didn't you come to, why didn't you come and tell me it was, it was sinking? They said, well, I, the guy said, well, I, I did, but there were so many mosquitoes that ran back inside the airplane. So the, the couple sank with the airplane peacefully and then settled on the ground. That's how I found the, the airplane the next morning. So it took me two days nonstop, uh, there's daylight all the time, to work and get the airplane out. And the it was cold, I can assure you, it was overcast and, and drizzle. And I eventually got the airplane out by using two empty 10 gallon cakes that I had on board. I had used the fuel and then I found a few others like, like this guy here and maybe, maybe this one. And it took me all this time to try to get the, the barrels on, on ropes and attach them to the back of the pond to, to dive and try to attach the knot. The, knot. But the, the, the barrels kept, the 10 gallon cakes kept popping up to the surface. I could never attach them. It was frustrating as hell. Anyhow, after two days, <clears throat> I figured, well, well the, the airplane was back on the water and I put all the, I drained all the fuel from the tanks into a 45 gallon drum, which was full of, of rust and sand, it doesn't matter because I had a, a chamois and a funnel to, to clear the, the fuel. So after a couple of days, I put my passengers back on, but I wasn't sure we'd have enough gas to get back to Great Slave Lake to the lodge at the east end of Great Slave Lake. So instead I flew up north to the previous village to Bay Chaimo Harbor. And there was th those few families you just saw, plus a small Hudson Bay post, which anywhere there was nobody, but there was a, a radio operating with batteries. So I called Maydays, 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 I spent hours calling on all the frequencies I could check. I could find there were crystals on HF. And, and then I collapsed on a pile of seal skins and, and slept for about eight or 10 hours. My passengers had bunks in the, in the Hudson Bay post, so they were okay. And, uh, and then eventually the message got through, through other Hudson Bay stations all around across the Arctic back to my company. And my, my fearless leader, the base manager came over uh, with a young helper with a full load of fuel and landed and, and uh, refuel the airplane and, and woke me up so we were able to fly back home. This is how beautiful the country is. This is north of uh, Great Bear Lake, absolutely beautiful in July. And those are little, little shrubs. In fact, they're, they're little trees that's uh, as high as they go. Beautiful country, very pretty. And in August, it's also, that's the northeast corner of Great Bear Lake where the the lodges, uh, very nice. It starts freezing uh, overnight. So by, by six o'clock in the morning, there is ice on the edges of the lake. Now that's becoming more serious <clears throat> in October because navigation gets even worse. So that's pretty awful. You can't, you can't gain any altitude. You have to fly underneath the stratus and go around hills. It's fairly flat, but still sometimes you can't get through, so you've got to go around. And when you don't know where you are to start with, and you start having to go around things, then after a while, you're really not too sure where you are and you're not too sure which way you're going. So for a while, the lakes are open, but then they start freezing from the small ones later on to the bigger ones. And that's also over the tundra and, and that's, that's hard flying sometimes. You go on four hours like this and you just don't know where you are, not too sure which way you're going. This is downtown Yellowknife. This is the main drag here. And that's before Yellowknife became the capital of the Northwest Territories. Um, it was a mining town with nothing but miners and their families. 
and uh, there was when it became the the capital of the Northwest Territories, first thing they did is installed a traffic light here. So there was a traffic light. Well, nobody bothered about it in winter because when it's going to stop, just slow down and avoid hitting other cars. So it didn't change anything to the traffic. And that's the local cinema. And one of my <clears throat> colleagues who rented the room and he discovered that if you lie down on the floor of the cinema with your head under the sink and, and, and next to the toilet, you can, you can see in the, inside the, the cinema through a hole on the ground where the drain pipe goes and you can actually see the movie and hear the sounds of the little hole. But it was only room for one eye at a time, so you could never invite us to see the movies. And this is clearing up the airplanes with the Herman Nelson to produce heat. Uh, it's a diesel burner, produce heat. And um, this young fellow is removing the frost from the wing in the foggy, foggy dews at 10 o'clock in the morning. And that's what the pilot does. Those are the blow pots and I just, it's out in the tundra somewhere. So it takes about an hour to warm up the engine in the morning. You have to dilute the oil with gasoline. And then you, you put blow pots. Here is the, the engine tent. You see, this is the cabin here and the engine tent cover the, the front of the airplane here and protects it from the wind. You can see it's going fairly hard. So I light the blow pots and I uh, push them underneath the engine with stove pipes, one leading to the cylinders, the other one leading to the oil tank. And sometimes I was so stressed and so frustrated and so cold and miserable because it typically 20, 30, 40 below. And sometimes there was a bit of a breeze uh, that I hoped the whole thing would blow up because the, the fuel tanks are just there. And there's oil dripping and gasoline dripping and the, the the oil is full of, of, of gas for dilution anyhow. So it never blew up, but sometimes I was hoping it would. That's a typical day. You fly for a couple of hours in the dark, you arrive here. That's way north of the uh, Arctic Circle. So that's around noon. That's as, as day, daylight, as much daylight as you get. And so you have to, I put the, the engine cover so it stays warm for about an hour or two while they're doing their thing. And uh, we unload the skidoo and we unload the, the sleigh and their gear and they go and do whatever they're doing, usually a geology or water resources measuring the water. Uh, if you think of it, it's just nuts. But they, they, they drill holes through, through five or six feet of ice to measure the water temperature under the ice. Well, guess what? It's about zero degrees. But if you wonder where your tax dollar go, that's to tell exactly the temperature of the water flowing underneath the ice in December along the Arctic coast. And it's usually minus 0 0.5. Uh, one day I, and it was in November, I had to bring some fuel drums to the, the camp there. So uh, that was just nothing but fuel drums. So I took my wife with me and we landed and I was told that the ice should be frozen to the bottom. And the purpose of the mission, I was told was to check that the ice had indeed 50 centimeters thickness required for landing with the beach 18 on wheels. And so I, I went, was there and uh, as soon as the airplane stopped, it, it crashed through the ice and was sticking out at 45 degrees, eventually it settled back fairly quickly, horizontally. So my wife and I came up with 35 below. I remember because my wife on landing was reading the, the gauge uh, on, on to the top right of the, the cabin, the outside temperature. And she just told me, oh, it's 35 degrees below. So we, we ran to the little shack, which 
I knew from previous trip was the kitchen was empty. There was a table and two chairs and absolutely nothing else. Uh, so I tried the next shop. Shack which was totally empty. There was nothing there. And the other shack was also empty except for a stove. And I was looking for matches and couldn't find any. So I went back to, by then, the outside of our clothes were totally frozen. I was frozen from the inside. My hands were all curled up and from the cold. My wife has stopped walking. I told her to keep walking so it wouldn't freeze too fast. But she said, look, I can't. I'm exhausted. I, I'm running out of steam. And so was I. And so I closed the door and said, well, we're going to sit down. And it's not going to be very long. And I closed the door so the, wool, the wolves wouldn't tear us apart. Uh, and then before sitting down, I said, look, I'll have another look. And I went around the shack and I found a little package of paper matches. So I ran like hell to this one where I had the stove, pulled out all the maps and the centerfold, Playboy centerfold off the walls, tore everything off and threw it in the stove and tried to latch a match. But the whole thing came off because I, my, my fingers were so clumsy that I couldn't operate completely properly and so and the, and the fire went, all the matches went off at the same time and that, and it caught fire and that's how we we were saved so the next day a twin engine uh, beach 18 from the company came over wondering why we were not back and they dropped a little message saying uh we're, we're going to come back not to worry uh we're going to come back and, and get you <clears throat> the day after, I had some, some tinglings in the distance, and a First Nation guy came in with a dog team. And he, well, he came in and stopped his dog team, and he said, oh, the ice is not too sick yet. So, yeah, I noticed. And he said, well, I came over because I, I know that usually when airplanes land in the distance, after a while, they take off again. But this one had landed and not taken off. So I wondered what happened. So I came over to, to have a look. So we gave him some tea. That's all there was in the kitchen. And he gave us a chunk of frozen caribou from his sleigh. He said, well, the ice is so thin, I can't take you back with me. His community is about 30 or 40 kilometers away. So I'll come back in a few days and take you up. And the day after, a big helicopter came over and they dropped two of our mechanics and they cut a big hole on the ice around the airplane, lifted it up, put it, put it, on, the, put it on the ice. And my wife and I came back to Yellowknife with the helicopter and the two mechanics stayed behind for a couple of days to drain the airplane and uh, fix the prop propeller blades because they were a little bit bent. And that's all there was to it. So two days later, they flew back to town with the airplane. That's a beach 18 with which I used to do the sked from Yellowknife to Fort Resolution to Fort Smith and sometimes to Lake Athabasca. I had 13 engine fillers with this thing. We had two or three of them. The problem was the carburetor heat and the carburetor heat wasn't working. And one day I had an engine fill, lost number one crossing Great Slave Lake which wasn't iced up. It was just barely frozen. There's no way you could land on it. So I crossed in the middle of Great, uh, Great Slave Lake, number one engine stop. So that's okay. I continued, landed here, and then took off again. The, the ice melted, so I took off again, went to Fort Smith, and then the number two engine stopped. So we landed in Fort Smith on one engine, on the sked and then I came back and after takeoff, number one engine failed again. I said, well, look, this, this is enough. Uh, so I turned around, came back and on the way back, number two engine stopped and we glided onto the runway in Fort Smith. I said, look, this thing needs to be fixed. And it was, that's the typical day's work. Uh, unloading supplies in a small First Nation community uh, northwest of Yellowknife. And they come and pick up the gear or they come and just visit. So a whole bunch of gear and people come out, a whole bunch of gear and some people go back in again. 
that's another community. Also, I stopped there for maybe an hour or so. By the time they unloaded the stuff and bring more to the plane, I had to put the cover on to make sure the engine would start. Now, this, this is a fun story. This is in the tundra northeast of Great Slave Lake, about maybe two hours away from Yellowknife to the northeast. We, we had dropped some prospectors. They're prospectors. They're looking for, for minerals At the, in, the, in the summer. And they were there with, with summer clothes and, and enough food to last for the summer. And were supposed to be picked up before freeze up at the end of the summer. Well, guess what? We forgot. So sometimes during freeze up, somebody realized, oh my God, we've forgotten those guys. I wonder if they're still alive. But by then you couldn't, you couldn't land. You had to wait for, for weeks until there was enough ice to, to be able to land. So we couldn't do anything. And then <clears throat> eventually with en enough ice, we went to find them. But it's one of those cases where the returning pilot puts a pin on the wall, but is not too sure where, where he landed. And that particular pilot was gone. So we couldn't even ask him. I don't think he put a pin on it. He described the area, I think, in the book. So, and then the pilot was gone. So nobody knew exactly where those fellows were, there's two guys. So one of our pilots flew and spent the five hours, two hours to go, two hours to come back, and one hour searching, looking for them because it's, it's only daylight from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. So you, you haven't got much time to do any searching. So he spent the day looking for them, didn't find them. The next day, the manager sent another pilot and he went there, spent the day searching and couldn't find them. And the next day, it was my turn to go. So I went there and that when I was flying around in this low stratus, I said, well, the guys are lost, we'll never find them. And at one point, flying low, right along this ridge, that's how low I was flying between ridges trying to find the tent. That's how hard it is to see it. I saw, I think, I, I, I saw a tent go by at, at close to 200 kilometers per hour. So <clears throat> I wasn't sure it was, it was a tent. So I turned on, came back, and sure enough, there was a tent and two guys jumped out and waving frantically. So I landed and they showed me how they had survived. Well, they had run out of food about six weeks earlier, but they should manage to shoot a caribou. So they survived on that caribou and they totally ran out, I think a week or two earlier, getting pretty skinny. Uh, and for heat, since they didn't have anything else, but some were closed, they had made a, a stove out of an aluminum uh, suitcase, which they had with them. So that was their stove. And they put some tin cans, one above the other for a chimney. You see the chimney sticking out. And they burn what they didn't eat in the, in the caribou, the, the antlers and the bones and guts and whatever they could. And then after a while, they had no more food and no more heat. So they were happy to see me. So I, I loaded them. But by the time we took off, it was getting dark. And after about 20 minutes, it was so dark, I, I was I was lost again I, I didn't know where i was and and and, and didn't know where we were going so i was desperately looking for a place to land and i ran into a, a big lake which was still open most of the way except the south end of it which was uh, frozen so that's the only place we could land so we landed on the frozen ice uh, at the end of the lake hoping we wouldn't go through and from two o'clock in the afternoon until 10 o'clock the next morning, we spend our time uh, waiting for uh, the daylight. And then the next day we took off and went back to town. This is Holman Island, a very nice Inuit community uh, where I went. And, and you land, there's no runway, you can land on, on the ice because it's so rough, it's awful. You can't land anywhere around the community. So I landed right downtown. 
And I, I don't think I landed between Nisa, but I landed between rows of houses. And it could have been between these houses and other houses on the site. I don't know, but I landed right downtown and stopped my run right in front of the church, the little wooden church in the middle. This is, uh, I'm coming close to the end of my, my this is my last story, uh, flying up to the 80s parallel in February. It was absolutely awful, never again. From Yellowknife to Cambridge Bay, uh, that's, well, you can see the scale, that's at least 400 miles or more. And then from Cambridge Bay to Ray Point on Melville Island. And then from then on, an 11 hour flight at night up in there without stopping the engine, refuel on the tundra on 45 gallon drums and coming back all in the dark under the stars, landing on the ice cap and landing on the tundra and landing here again on the tundra and somewhere else on the ice cap. It was just awful. It was so cold inside the otter that at one point the, the passengers sent me a, a bottle of whiskey and I thought they were feeling sorry for me because I must have looked miserable. I, I was totally petrified and sick in the belly. And so I thought they were, wanted to cheer me up with the bottle of whiskey. So they passed on the bottle of whiskey. It turned out it was frozen. That's inside the cabin. Whiskey was frozen. And so that was just a, a kind way to let me know that <laughs> the heating system wasn't working. I, I know it wasn't working because I was so afraid of running out of fuel that I turned off the heat. So it was just as cold inside as outside. So here's Cambridge Bay, that's, that's the first community. The other one I'm going to show you is Ray Point there. So here's the first one, Cambridge Bay. And you see navigation in the tour guide. This is, this is water, this is the Arctic Ocean, this is Cambridge Bay, and this is the tundra. No compass and uh, the directional gyro compass doesn't hold for more than 20 minutes or half an hour. What saved us is that I had a C4 compass which automatically corrects for precession. And without that, I would never have been able to make it. Because how, 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 how do you know which way you're going and how do you know where you are? I mean, it's, it's just not possible. This is navigation. Now here I could tell I'm over land because here there's a ridge of some kind. But in most places you see little patches of, a, of, of ice and you don't know whether it's sea ice or lake ice. And it's all flat. And that's around the middle of the day. This is noon. And I, this is the astro compass, which I use to take sights on the sun and on the, on the moon to reset the gyro compass. So this is noon. And I know this is 180 degrees true south. So I, I take a sight with this one and I can tell knowing the angle of the astral compass vis-a-vis -vis the axis of the airplane, because there is a, a graduation at the foot of it, I can tell which way we're going and uh, reset the gyro. This is Melville Island. This is halfway up to the 80s parallel. Melville Island. This is the ocean up front. This is land. This is the ocean in the back. And we only found it because there was a little radio beacon, which you could pick up from maybe 20 or 30 miles. So you, you've got to be pretty accurate to be able to, to catch it. And once you've got it, then you're in business. You just, just come in and, and land. And I'm going to show you the camp here. I think, no, no I'm not showing you the camp. Uh, this is the last picture. This is noon at 80s parallel landing. This is the tundra. This is the ice. And these are some of my passengers. I have to be six passengers plus all their gear. And one of them came back because he could see fresh bear track. There was a, a bear in hibernation in the neighborhood who may have just gone out for a pee in the middle of the winter and then back again to his den. So he came back to get a rifle. But uh, so that we landed on, uh, this is the tundra and 
at times we had to land on the ice also because they wanted to check the ice. They wanted to go there to see if it was possible to have a convoy of oil rigs uh, and equipment uh, on caterpillars uh, to do oil exploration in, in this area. And they decided it was not possible, it's too rough. So it, anything has to be flown in. And that's my last uh, image. So that's the that's the uh, uh, photo that I used for the cover of the book, which just came out a couple of weeks ago. You can it's twenty five bucks plus shipping. If you use the publisher and wait, if you do a if a screen print a print screen, then you can capture this information. Otherwise, you you contact me. Uh, but you can uh, you can get it from the publisher. But if you do, make sure that you use Canadian dollars because it's the same price in U.S. dollars. So you don't want to pay twenty five U.S. dollars. You want to pay twenty five Canadian dollars. There's a, a book retailer here, which I understand is the largest for aviation books. Largest in and in, in Amazon and in Amazon, be careful. Also, they sell the book for a big poster saying thirty-five dollars, and then in the fine print it says we have a couple of new books available for twenty-five. So that's the one you click. You don't you don't click the thirty-five dollars. You click the twenty-five dollars. Thank you very much. That's the end of my stories. <laughs>